today is JWB's Rental Income Property of the Week. Week, 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 week. Where we're gonna, where we're gonna review 1039 Westbrook Circle East. That is only $123,000. And JWB covers the first 2.6K of maintenance cost. I, like I, I told you a while back, man, I want to make you the, what's his name? The Richard Branson of real estate, man. I, I really, I really see that in your future. And I think the only way I do that is by, by getting your, your face and your thoughts and, and, and the way that you communicate out into the world. And that's what this is all about, my friend. You know how uncomfortable that makes me every time you say that, by the way. <laughs> I do. And I kind of enjoy it. I, kind of I think enjoy you it. do. Comfortable, but not as much as I enjoy the fact that we are currently Live on Facebook for the Not Your Average Investor Show Thursday edition, the JWB Rental Income Property of the Week. Week, 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 week. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me as always, the guy I call the Richard Branson of real estate, but most people call him GC because he comes up with genius concepts because he generates cash flows because he's a great co-host and because his name is Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Super excited to be here coming at you from the new and improved JWB studio here. It's good. It's good, man. It looks really, really nice, man. I love the logo in the background. I like, I, I like the angle. Soon we're going to have multiple camera angles. And just like we got multiple camera angles, we got multiple ways to interact with us. You like that tying, Greg? Yes. This show is driven by you right? So if you are here right now, we want you chatting with us. We want you chatting with each other in the chat. And there's a little trick to that right now. When you first pop open that chat and you say something, it only shows to me and Greg because it defaults to panelists. So you got to change to panelists and attendees and that way everybody else sees it, right? So Leo and Nadim, they've been here and Mark who've been here a bunch of times, they're doing it correctly. But uh, Saiba, Greg, Gene, and Raja, you are only speaking to us right now. So we'd love it if you change to panelists and attendees. That way you can all, you know, glean off each other's wisdom, make a friend. This is what this community is all about. And if you want a question asked live on the show as we're going through this beautiful property that we're about to that we're about to talk about, there's a QA box that you pop open, put your questions in there. That's the easiest way to get it from you asking it to me asking it to the GC right here. Bill Shields, welcome, buddy. Surf's up. To you, man. I hurt my back, so I have not been able to surf this week, but I hope you're scoring, buddy. Last but not least, if you want to fiddle with this fancy spreadsheet that we've been fiddling with every Thursday since we started fiddling, and we'll be fiddling some more, go to jwbroi.com and you're going to be able to download this spreadsheet. Oh, no, wait a minute. We, yeah. got, something, we got something even better than that. If me- you want to see this property right now, we have it up on jwbinventory.com. This is a this is a new rollout that we've been doing. Last week we didn't have it live yet. This week we got it live. You can go see all the past properties of the weeks plus all the ones that that we're going over live. So go to jwbinventory.com. That's a new website that we've created for our Thursday show, which it's kind of our favorite show, right, Greg? Well, don't tell anybody. Don't yeah, tell we're anybody. not going to tell anybody. No, but I, yeah, I, I, but listen. let me just piggyback on that. So this show is meant to be interactive. How much of a better way to be interactive than looking at the actual property evaluation like I have just printed out right here, right now. So you all can go there, jwbinventory.com. And right there, you can download the evaluation. And then you can mess around just like Pablo and I do with the numbers. You can change it to your down payment percentage, to your interest rate that you think, whatever it may be, this is meant to be interactive and to be enjoyed by all of you. So go ahead and do it. If you're in front of a computer right now, why don't you do that since you're chiming in anyways and and paying attention, it'll just make it even more enjoyable for you. Greg Greg Stone's already taking it for a test drive. He says, yep, it works. And Marilyn from Homosassa, Florida. Home of the manatees. She popped in for a second and now she's got to go to the dentist. Marilyn, I'm pretty sure that this would be more fun than going to the dentist, but you got to do what you got to do. You catch it on the podcast. (laughs) Greg, let's do this, man. You ready to hop into the property right now? Yeah, brother. Let's do it. Ready to be magically whisked away to 1039 Westbrook Circle East in Jacksonville, Florida, 32209, a purchase price of $123,000. This is a quaint two-bedroom, one-bathroom home with a driveway parking, 
It's estimated rent range from 825 to 875, leasing for two to three years. And the number that we really come, what you are buying when you are buying into this asset class is not just this picture. It's this number right here. The estimated conventional financing total monthly cash flow of $138 and this estimated conventional financing total return on investment of just shy of 9%, 8.96%. Let's start where we always start, Greg. What does this monthly cash flow number represent, please? Monthly cash flow for you is really important. That is the first threshold you should look at when investing in a rental property. This is an asset that should pay for itself every single month. And so when you see estimated cash flow of $138 uh, for a conventionally financed purchase, what that means to you is that this is paying for itself. That rental income is more than covering all of those normal monthly expenses. And that's really the first threshold, the first key metric you should be looking at when investing in a rental property. Specifically, the way that we get to that $138 estimated is we take the gross monthly rent that we collect and we take out your principal payments, your interest payments, your property taxes, your property insurance costs, and your monthly management fees. Those are there each and every single month uh, when the home is rented. So that's what's going to happen on a normal month for you, which the vast majority of months will be normal months as an owner of rental properties with JWB. And, uh, and that's what nets out that $138. And really even more than that, what that should represent to you is that this is now a scalable model for you. So much about rental properties is making sure that your overall financial portfolio is balanced. It's not top heavy in the stocks, bonds, mutual funds arena, which many people have too much that their overall portfolio, the, there's too much of a, uh, uh, the percentage is too high in those traditional asset classes. So if you really want to have a balanced portfolio, maybe it's a half and half or 75, 25 or whatever the number is for you, you have to be able to invest in rental properties and be able to buy more than one, right? And if you go cash flow negative every single time, but your goals dictate that you need to own 10 properties, well, that's not going to be very fun. That's not scalable. It's going to be a huge liability for you every single month to, to carry the, the cost there. And that's not what we do here at JWB. It's not what we believe in. So buying assets that pay for themselves is the number one threshold. That's what you see with $138. But there's another threshold that's really important. That's where we start to look at the next thing, brother. Pablo, would you like me to go into the total return on investment? I mean, listen, buddy, the way that you sound on this mic right now, you can go into whatever you want to go into. Yeah. Let's it, talk it about total different, on. right? It sounds a little bit different today, right? I mean, I don't know if it sounds different. It sounds, according to Bill Shields, it sounds sexy on the new mic. Uh, <laughs> Lee Bishop says, you went there with Greg and his smooth voice. Mark Larratt writes, writes Branson-esque. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on here, but it's it's smooth as butter is what they're saying. You guys, yeah, please. You guys are crazy. Please, please tell, us a little, tell us a little story about uh, total return on investment. <laughs> Oh man, I can't even go there. Can't even go there. So I'm going to get back to total return on investment because that's where I'm comfortable. Total return on investment. What we're talking about here, as great as cash flow is, positive cash flow is as that first threshold, it's, it is myopic. It is looking at only one of the five profit centers. And to make sure that your money is best working for you and to compare this decision to buy this rental property to other things that you could do with your money, you need to look at all five profit centers. And so this total return on investment metric, which is that 8.96%, that looks at other profit centers. So it takes into account some other good things that are happening for you, those other profit centers. It also takes into account some other expenses that will happen at some time. We don't know exactly when, it won't happen every single month, but some point it will happen and we need to take those into account. And so specifically on the negative side, what this total return on investment takes into account is maintenance costs, vacancy costs, tenant placement fees. These are all things that will happen at some point for you. We just need to know what they are. So we, we take that into account. Also takes into account closing costs, which is often forgotten when investors are, are buying rental properties, but that does affect your return on investment. So it takes all of that into account on the negative side. And on the positive side, you're looking at your estimated tax savings and you're looking at your principal pay down, which are two of the profit centers that are really impactful for you. What's really interesting is that if you think about what we've talked about in past shows as purchase prices are going up, as interest rates are going up, that's diminishing future cash flows. 
you know, at some point it's going to be break even or somewhere around there. And, you know, so many people right now are so focused just on positive cash flow. They look at, they don't look at the other profit centers, but soon what they're going to find is that cash flow is going to be diminished. And you're going to find that tax savings, principal pay down and the other profit centers, which I'm sure we'll talk about here in just a second. Those are still going to be very strong, right? But it's funny now that everybody in for the last five years, decade, whatever you want to say, as far as rental property investors go, everybody's been so cash flow sensitive, cash flow sensitive. That's the profit center that's going away. It's that, that cash flow. So you got to look beyond that. You got to look at tax savings, principal pay down. We look at that and we incorporate that into your total return on investment. And we have a spot for including home price appreciation. That is, of course, one of the additional profit centers, but we keep it at 0% right off the bat. Pablo, why do we do that? Because the JWB likes to underpromise and overdeliver, and when it comes to the thing that makes Jacksonville truly, truly special, I know you're like you're like Jaws. You don't show the shark till the end, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that is the home price appreciation component is the reason that people. It's mainly the reason that people will choose a market over like Jacksonville over Cleveland, or a growth market like Jacksonville over a no growth market somewhere in the Midwest, Kansas City you know, these types of, of markets, they're great for cash flow, but growth is not their strong suit. They do not appreciate at the same rate as the U S national average. Whereas Jacksonville, if you look over the last 30 years, we've appreciated at a rate that's 19% more than the national average in the country, right? That's unique to be a cash flow market where you can get positive cash flow and you have above average home price appreciation. So that's one of the main reasons clients come to Jackson to Jacksonville and why clients come to JWB is because they want to capture that growth. The thing about home price appreciation is in order to do this, if you are only investing for the short term, one years, three years, five years, whatever the, the, the number may be in the short term, you're speculating on home price appreciation, right? The way, and listen, we think home prices are going up, but I can tell you the way to actually make sound investment decisions to think about market cycles. And a full market cycle is how you should analyze home price appreciation because cycles, by definition, repeat themselves. And historically, Jacksonville appreciates at a 4.3% home price appreciation rate on average each year. But to do that, you need to be invested for a full market cycle. That's where you will likely wind up 10, 20 years after holding onto the properties from today. So we keep it at 0% because we like to underpromise and overdeliver. Because our assets speak for themselves, they stand on their own two feet, even if you don't include home price appreciation. And because I don't know if you're actually going to hold on for a full market cycle. But if you are, then you can count on it. You, you should be putting you know, home price appreciation rates into your calculations and at least using that as a deciding factor between markets. Because you will find that you can make literally hundreds of thousands of dollars more by investing in a market that has shown to, to be a high growth market over the long haul than if you choose a market that's solely based on cash flow and doesn't grow at the same rate. Got it, Greg. So if I am somebody who has decided that I'm going to hold on to this property for at least 10 years, probably 20, 25 years, full market cycle, and I'm choosing between Cleveland, who you hate, Jacksonville, and maybe a couple of other cities that you don't hate so much, but they're just other cities, I'm going to put 4.3% appreciation in here to guide my investment Let's talk about Cleveland for a second. Okay. All right. I think of Cleveland like the little brother, right? If you're like six years older than your little brother and you know, you can like, he's like trying to punch you, but you're just like holding his face <laughs> away from him. You know, that's how I think of Cleveland. I love Cleveland. You know, I like I'm like a little brother that I'm just like so, so much bigger than them and they can't really hurt me. Yeah. That's you're kind right. of how I, I feel I, about I, it from a home price appreciation perspective. Yeah. I kind of feel the way about the University of Georgia, but we're not going to go there. So we put in 4.3% appreciation here because you're going to be in it for the long term. And well, bam, it goes from 8.97 to 24.56. Now we're talking a major, major boost on ROI when you are encountering, you know, when you are in it for a long term cycle and you can count on this stuff. Can you explain the mathematics between in going from 9%, you know, 24 and a half percent with just 4.3% appreciation? Yes, absolutely. So this is the beauty of using leverage, using smart debt. Right now is the best time to be 
uh, fully aware and employing smart debt to help you grow your wealth. Uh, because interest rates right now are the absolute lowest that they're going to be. Can't go any lower. They've already actually started to their, their climb. Rates are slowly starting to climb. You're starting to see movement where rates are going to be going up. They're going to be going up a lot in the coming years. I mean, it's, it's just going to be that way. When you leverage smart debt and you have an asset that grows, let's just say it grows 4% a year. If you average or if you leverage smart debt, that, that means that your real growth, your real return on that appreciation is a lot more than 4%. And here's just a simple way to calculate it. If there's a property that you're purchasing and you buy it for $100,000, and you buy it with all cash. And that value goes up 4% that year. The way you calculate the return on investment from that appreciation would be $4,000 of the appreciation over your investment, which is $100,000, which is a 4% return from the home price appreciation. If you bought that same asset with smart debt that paid for itself every single month, you used smart debt, but you only put down 25% well, your growth is actually $4,000 divided by your investment, which is $25,000. So you still get to capture all of that real growth of the appreciation, but your, the amount that you invested is much less. And so $4,000 divided by $25,000 is actually a 16% return just on the appreciation. And roughly, if you add that 16% return to the 9% roughly that it was when we didn't count home price appreciation, that's how you get to roughly 25% here, which is what it is if you're starting to look at more and more and more of the profit centers, which is really how you need to be investing in rental properties to win over the long haul. The concept of leverage, man, never, get, never gets old for me because I had no idea about it until maybe like the fourth or fifth not your average investor show property of the week that we did where like I finally started really understanding it. And if you take it one step further, we're talking about a 25% down payment, right? So that's a multiplier of four. If you go into a 20% down payment, it's like a multiplier of five, right? So it goes from like 16% to 20%. And that's what I've chosen to do with the properties that I've invested in, right? Cause I'm in it for the long and tall. I'm not so worried about the short-term cash flow as much as like you said, it being scalable pays for itself. And I'm in it for the long run because I'm trying to like build these assets and, you know, maybe one day do a big boy move like a 1031 exchange. Greg, we have a question in here from Lee Bishop, current reigning MVP of the Not Your Average Investor Show community. He asks, can you get into why the insurance is way high in this property? Is that something with remodel houses or is it something else? And I'm just going to, since we repurpose this into, into podcasts, we have a friend in the future right now that's listening in his or her ear. Just to explain, we have a, a figure down here that says estimated annual homeowner's insurance of $1,012. And I guess in Lee's perspective, that's high. Greg, can you give me a little, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think at the end of the day, what we're searching for is the best risk adjusted return on investment. And so some folks will say, well, are new construction properties better or renovated homes better? And my answer is I love them both. I want the best risk adjusted return on investment. And so with renovated homes, you have a path to that same style. Let's call it that seven to 9% return on investment, absent of home price appreciation, you know, seven to 9% or so. Your path to getting there is, is slightly different than new construction, but you get to seven to 9% with the upside from appreciation. New construction, on the other hand, Again, slightly different. Some things are better, some things are worse, but you're going to arrive at that 7 to 9% return. Again, of course, with the upside of potential home price appreciation if you hold on for a full market cycle. So you, you can get there either way. For, ren for renovations, a couple of things that really work in your favor. You generally have a lower purchase price, which is wonderful, right? Because you have a lower purchase price, that gives you a better chance for a higher risk-adjusted return on investment. Your rent to price ratio is typically a little bit better for renovations, mainly because your purchase prices are generally a little bit lower. Rents are strong. And so your rent to price ratio is a little bit higher. Your property taxes are usually a little bit lower, again, because that is largely in, in line with your low purchase prices. Insurance is not going to work in your favor for a renovation, right? Insurance is going to be a little bit higher because the insurance companies look at the loss that they take and 
because homes are that are built now are to much higher standards than what they were in the past. And because homes that are just recently built have less costs, less losses for an insurance company than ones that were built a long time ago, the premiums for insurance on a renovated home are going to be higher than if they were a new construction home. It's just, you have a lot of pluses on the renovation side. You have some minuses. A couple of other things to point out on the renovation side, you're going to have a higher maintenance rate. So if you see on this evaluation, it's actually 6% is the estimation for your maintenance cost. That's actually 6% of the rents that we collect. So if you wanted to multiply that out, you'd take the, the monthly rent of 850 times 12 times 6% would be how much you should expect in maintenance costs on average each year. Well, for a new construction property, that's actually 4%. So you're going to have slightly higher maintenance costs on renovations. This is, again, you get to the same path, seven to 9%, whether it's a renovation or a new construction, but you just have a slightly different path. And homeowner's insurance is just a little bit more expensive when it's a rental. Makes sense, man. So we talked about reno. We talked about new construction versus reno. This house also is on sewer, right? You want to talk about kind of sewer versus septic and how that affects the cost here? Yeah, we've talked a lot about septic lately because we have some really exciting things that are going to continue to mitigate the risk and hopefully increase the returns on septic properties. This one happens to be a sewer property. This is on city sewer. So, and one of the wonderful things that we do here at JWB is we have this incredible amount of data because we've been doing this for 15 years because I personally own over 300 rental properties because we serve over 1,200 clients who have purchased over 2,000 properties just like this one, we track and measure and have created this data flywheel. And so we look for key triggers that may influence expectations on future properties that we sell. So for example, the maintenance rate, we have looked at the maintenance cost and we have established that properties that are on city sewer have a lower expected maintenance cost than properties that are on a septic tank on renovations that are on a septic tank. And we've just seen this documented over thousands of properties. So because we know that, we then bring it to the investor before they even purchase. And we say, okay, great, we know this. Your expected maintenance cost on a property that's on sewer like this is 6%. If this property was on a septic tank, it's going to have an expectation of 9%. Because historically, that's what the data has represented. Now, does that mean that septic properties are bad investments? No. What that means is in order to get to that 7 to 9% return, JWB has to make sure that the deal is a little bit better in some other place to make sure that we can overcome slightly higher maintenance costs. And that's what we do. And you can do that in a number of different ways, right? JWB probably had to buy the property at a little bit lower cost so that we could sell it at the right price to make sure that the 7 to 9% return would work. Or it has to rent for a little bit more to make sure that the numbers work or property taxes need to be lower or insurance costs, maybe they're lower, right? Whatever it has to be, you have to be able to offset that and still set the investor up for success, knowing that you are going to have slightly higher maintenance costs if it's a septic tank. Yeah. So this is, first of all, you know, that when you say data flywheel, I start getting all, it gives me, gives, gives me the goosebumps, right? Cause once we're starting talking about like Jim Collins style, building a business stuff that you guys have incorporated, fascinates me, but this is kind of, this is the tactical advantage of doing business with somebody that's completely vertically integrated into one market that, you know, has taken the extra steps of not just building a real estate business, but building a real estate business, the way that Amazon built a, <laughs> a shopping platform, right? Like you're, you have incorporated all the all the same methodologies of what has made Amazon successful. You've created a flywheel that <clears throat> makes sure at the middle of it is one thing that you do very, very well. You call that your hedgehog, which is finding profitable properties to, to, to find, build, you know, fix, rent out, do that, and then gathering the data around that continually informs the process. And as that flywheel keeps spinning, you get better and better at this. So I guess, what I'm hearing is that there's a couple of variable points here, right? Like if I'm talking to somebody else and, they're, and they sent me a, a different sheet, right? Like it's the idea that number one, 
are you vertically integrated in your turnkey provider really controlling the property management side? So therefore, is this vacancy rate something that's real or is the vacancy come out of a book? Then there is, is this maintenance rate specific to the property that you have or is it, again, a number out of a book? And JWB has real data that varies the maintenance rate versus based on new home versus renovated, sewer versus septic, and a couple of other variable points that create different combinations that give you an a, a, like a real live maintenance rate to expect based on data, not based on the farmer's almanac, right? Yeah, well played, man. Exactly right. There you go. There you go. Cool, man. I, I feel like that there is a what are we on? We're in Westbrook Circle. I think there's a a Westbrook story about a a sewer uh, about a sewer septic tank that was ill forgotten, kind of like Maria and the guy in West Side Story. Do we have a Do we have a story about that that you have teed up for us, Greg? I mean, you, how you've compared me to Branson today, how you wanted me to speak like Barry White, and now I've got some West Side Story like story I'm supposed to have for you. I mean, the bar that you're setting is way too high. You know, I can't handle that. But I do have a really cool case study. And this has nothing to do with this Westbrook property too, but you know, I'm in our meetings during the week. This was, so my business partners and I sit down every month and we review what's called our sales cards. And so we get to see how the numbers work on all the assets that our clients picked up over the, over the previous month. And when we were going through the numbers, I guess it was a week or two ago, this story just kind of jumped out to me. And I thought it was a really cool example of how you can have a win across the board and how a vertically integrated company like JWB really is the only one who's going to solve this issue. So just to kind of let set this, the landscape, right? We all know that it is tough right now for turnkey providers to find inventory. For JWB, if we were just buying properties today to be able to serve the demand, we wouldn't be able to handle it. And that's why others are struggling. Obviously, we have been doing this for a long time. We're vertically integrated. We've been here for 15 years and we've acquired land to make sure that inventory is not a challenge for us. But at the end of the day, right, it's tougher to buy properties today than it was a year ago, five years ago. I mean, it's not even comparable. So we're always looking for ways to be able to source more inventory. And it's not to meet the demands of today as much as it is to meet the demands of three years from now. For the clients that have entrusted us to build their buying plan to make sure that we have consistent assets for them. Well, this is a really cool story. This was a house that we actually bought and then rented and then sold to a turnkey client. The address is 3722 Menti Road here in Jacksonville. And I'll tell you kind of the predicament from the, from the seller's perspective. So the seller was actually a client of ours. Okay. They were a property management client. So in addition to doing property management services for those who buy properties from us, we also do property management services if you don't buy from us. So this was a seller. We call those clients property management clients typically versus turnkey clients, right? So our property, this was a property management client, didn't buy the asset from us, but he has over 90 homes that we manage for him. So this home on Menti had a big problem. It's a, an old home and this, it was on a septic tank and the septic tank floated, which means it came up. It was a big problem. When something like that happens, typically you work with the health department and the city and you fix the issue and you put the septic tank back in the ground and make sure everything passes inspections. And it's not fun. It's expensive, but you know, there's a, there's a remedy for that. For this one, that wasn't possible. The septic tank became exposed. The drain field became exposed. The city, because the water table was too high, the city would not allow the owner to put the septic tank back in the ground. So if you're an owner at that point, you've got a house that was a resident living in the home. You're, the value of your asset just went down dramatically. Right? If you can't, if, right? I should also add that there was no city sewer access here. So you got a house that can't put a septic tank in and has no access to city sewer. What do you do? the value of that asset just went to the land value basically, right? So this was a current client of ours. Of course, we, we've been serving him for a long time. He came to us and said, I don't know what to do. So because of our connections, because we know how to handle situations like this, we were able to work with the city to extend the existing sewer line. 
because we have done this in the past and because we have other, have other assets in the area, it actually made sense for us to pay to do that, which would normally be cost prohibitive. If you have just one single house, you, it's typically not going to work for you to pay the money, even if you knew how to do it to extend the city line, the sewer line. But that's what we were able to do. So we built those costs into the offer we were able to buy the property for from the client. Nobody else was able to solve the problem for the client. So he was ecstatic that he could be able to sell the house. He was able to sell the house for $50,000, which is a lot more than just land value right there, right? So this was a huge win for him. We were able to buy this property. We extended the sewer line, which is a tremendous amount of work and just don't know how to do that normally. We renovated this home, of course, after this past inspections, you know, city sewers there, which is wonderful for that house and for other homes on the street potentially as well. And we were able to put a long-term resident in that home who's in there now and, and, and really just enjoying the experience. So a real win all across the board. And last but not least, the winner is the client because this is one house that in an environment right now where you're, it's really hard to get inventory. This is a client that was able to add one more property, one more asset take advantage of historically low interest rates today, be able to do that. And I think it's a real credit to the entire team to be able to solve these problems is a credit to being here for 15 years. Like these are the things that we can do because we are so focused solely on Jacksonville that you just can't do if you're in 15 different markets. Yeah, it was, uh, I framed it as a Westbrook story, but this is a vertical integration story, man. Like this is, this is the, the idea that like we spoke about, about, was it 10 days ago and like, a previous Tuesday from, from last one, how you start $3 million worth of construction every single month. So you have that like core capacity and, and core, whatever you dominate these neighborhoods. So one infrastructure project for a neighborhood doesn't just benefit one house. It benefits multiple houses and multiple assets that you can serve. It's the know-how of how to get it done by having people on the committees that run the downtown area by having relationships with people like Lori Boyer and, and, you know, Daniel Davis and all these different people that we've brought onto the show, man. I think that's really, really remarkable. So tell me a little bit more about that transaction. So this, this client owned the house. It became a kind of an ass, you know, it became a nightmare asset for him at a certain right. Like he lost, he thought he lost this thing. You bought the house from him mm -hmm. and then renovated and resold it to him or does JWB now own that asset? Like what is, what, what how did that? Yeah. Happen? Thanks for letting me clarify. So we bought the house from that client. Mm -hmm. We then, of course we owned it. We then renovated it. Mm -hmm. And then we sold that house to a different client. Got it. Got it. And did this client go out and buy another JWB home with that 50 G's that he just put in his pocket? What's he doing? You know, I don't know. He's got over 90 properties. I think his acquisitions timeline is, as you know, has come and gone. So, you know, I'm not sure about that, but he, he is super stoked. I can tell you that. That's awesome, man. That's a great, that's a really, really great win-win, man. I, what a cool well, and, story to hear. And the big thing that I want everybody to know here is, you know, a lot of folks are asking, well, you know, how is JWB going to make sure that we have a future runway of inventory, right? Everybody hears how prices are going up how it's going to be more and more challenging in the future than it is even today to acquire inventory. Well, initiatives like this is what we do every single day, right? We've got a huge focus, just not just within our acquisitions department, but one of the leaders, one of the owners of our company's sole role is really to figure out what's coming next to make sure that we're solving the inventory challenges for three years from now. And, you know, this asset class is so beautiful I really love it. But for many people, just being able to take part, I feel like many people now get it and there's such a rush into rental properties. It's going to be really disappointing for a lot of people when they buy their first house or they buy their second house and that turnkey provider that they bought that house with no longer has any inventory for them in six months or in a year, right? I really feel I'm very confident that a lot of the players in the space right now will not be selling rental properties to clients in two years from now because the inventory challenges are real. So it's like, if you can get into this asset class and buy right now, that's amazing. You're gonna see how much you love it, especially if you work with a great provider. The next thing is you're gonna say is, well, now that I've got one, how do I get to three, right? Those are the questions that we are working on today, not just to solve for today, to solve for three years for now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Great. Listen, as you're, as you're saying this, I got to beg the question, right? Not every house that we have on the property of the week 
is available for sale. This is a house that is at $123,000. It's a pretty, it's what I would call an easy thing to get into, right? Like if you only need, you only need to come up with, you know, 24,000 plus closing costs here. Is, is this house for sale? Is it already purchased? Has this one already moved? I didn't check. I didn't check before I got on the show. You, you know, I, you know, I got a fancy new Mac computer here. I usually have a PC and I couldn't figure out how to go log into Salesforce to check before. And I was, so I don't know what I would recommend if, if anybody is interested. First of all, even if this home isn't available, we have a number of other homes that are very similar. We operate in a very small box. So this is built so that if you're, if you like this home, you're probably going to like the other 10 or 15 that are available. So reach out to my team. You can do that by scheduling a time. You can just go on right now and go to chatwithjwb.com. Schedule a time to speak with my, my team and you'll be, you'll be in a good spot, even if this one isn't available anymore. All right. Yeah, man, this house looks a lot like, it's funny, right? Like four, was it four weeks ago that we profiled that 71, 71 lucky. And I was like, oh my God, I need this house. And, and now I feel like every house for the last three weeks has looked exactly like that. It just didn't have a 71, 71 lucky address. <laughs> so yeah. You know, when, you, when we were going through that and you told me that you're interested, it was great because, you know, you said, Hey, I'm interested. I said, okay, let me, let me just connect you with, with Stad over on the sales team. And, and I said, you know, I was like, oh, okay, that'd be awesome. And you're like, Hey, listen, Greg, I get it. Listen, even if it's not available right now, I know there's going to be another one that's coming down the pike. It's not a big deal. And for me, I was, that was so personally gratifying for you to, to understand the value of this, but to also understand at the end of the day, these are widgets. Yeah. These houses are widgets. You got to buy into the model, which you do, you see the value in it. And then you know that there's going to be another one just like it. Right. So I appreciate you listening to me all these, all, all these, well, it's been over a year now because you're, you're, I mean, you just get this at a very deep level now. I mean, I get this at a very deep level because I've had a great fortune of sitting here with you, you know, once a week for the first couple months. I, I really think that it's been since we started the property of the week show that I really, really started getting this at a deep level. Like I remember like three months into you and me kind of starting and we were already running together and spending, you know, more time with each other than with anybody else in COVID times as we, as we have uh, been very open about. I, I still, I would still talk to friends of mine, right? I remember my buddy, Chris Kraft and, and, and talk to them about like, man, this is awesome. And they got this company and like Tuesday morning meetings, they got this incredible culture and this business model. And they would still bring up something about the asset class. And I was like, that I couldn't answer, right? Like they would always have some kind of like, yeah, but this is how it happens in rental properties because I had one in Redwood City, California and this is what happened. And it's been it's been these like back to back to back to back to back, not, you know, rent, rental property of the week. Week, 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 week. <laughs> yeah, that, that has been the reps that have allowed me to really, really understand this. I, I just sent you, I just sent you a text, was it two days ago? Somebody hit me up on Facebook about something or another that they're selling some agriculture property. I was like, oh man, if you're doing that, you should think about a 1031 exchange because you can take all the, you know, taxes and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And like in like two textbooks, in, in two Facebook messages, I was able to like clearly contextualize exactly what this thing is and how, you know, even though it says 9%, it's really 24% and, you know, all these different things, the different markets and everything like that. I, I think it's, it's, I feel very, very fortunate that I've got to sit in this chair, listen to really smart people like Lee and, and Leo and Nadim and the people that show up every single week, ask really good questions that allows me to continue to contextualize. And I've just gotten so many reps at it that I'm, I'm fully bought in. I totally understand that this is a widget, right? Like I know that this isn't a, this isn't investing in real estate. It's investing in an asset class because you've completely commoditized and vertically integrated it. So it's like, I look at it the way that I would look at a T-bill or a stock or whatever, based on the risk adjusted rate of return and how much it costs to get into it and what my timeline needs to be for me to be able to really expect the actual profits that you know, are validated by your data flywheel. And it just makes it easy, man. That's why by the time I bought one property, I was already selling stock to buy my second property. And now I'm in the process of buying my second property and hoping I can land a couple of big clients in the next couple of months so I can buy a third property by the end of the year kind of thing, right? Like it's been amazing, man. I, I feel fortunate. It's awesome, man. Really, really gratifying. And I appreciate, I really appreciate the trust that you put in me. It's been awesome, man.
You earned it, buddy. You earned it. And yeah, Greg Stone, Pablo drank the Kool-Aid. Pablo, Pablo is a little tipsy on the Kool-Aid over here. Right? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm all in on this Kool-Aid. If there are no other questions, Greg, what a, have you, this house, this is 32209. I feel like I've seen the zip code a thousand times. Mm-hmm. What is this? West side, north side? East, I guess it's circle east. Like, do you know what kind of, what neighborhood in Jacksonville this is? Yeah, north side. This is the north side, right? So this is this is the the neighborhood that is north of downtown, close to the port, close to Amazon facilities, and mm-hmm. close to downtown, right? Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit south of your house on the north side. It's a little bit south of your my first, first house. house. Yeah, there you go. On the north side, because now, now I have a portfolio. Or there I will, you. I will, once I start closing on this. And by the way, listen, man. So from true experience, to add some context to what we're saying of interest rates rising, First house I closed on was a 3.6% interest rate. Yeah. Now I'm looking at like 38 to 4.0% interest rate. Yeah. So if any if, if anybody's asking that that stuff of the of the interest rates kind of coming up is already is already starting to manifest a little bit. Are you how when when is it that you guys you guys have like a round table of mortgage leaders that you mm-hmm. talk to? How often? What is that? Talk to them on well, we talk to them more often than on a weekly basis, but every week they give us their updated interest rates. And you know, interest rates can be an interesting thing when you ask one lender versus another lender. You really have to standardize it because there are different ways for lenders to charge fees and whatever. So for us, we have a standard approach. We get to see what the interest rate would be with the with the allowable amount of fees that they can earn. And we get that every single week. I just looked at it actually. Yeah. What did I tell you? I mean, largely where you're at, right? It's it's gone up, call it, you know, quarter point from where potentially the, you know, the most qualified borrowers could be call it a quarter ago, right? There's, there's a little bit of movement there for us though, on the property evaluation, on the first evaluation that for the property you bought, Pablo, do you remember the expected interest rate that we gave you? It was four. It was 4%. Yeah. 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 So and on, I got on, a 3.6. You got a 3.6, right? We do that be, for a couple of different reasons. Not everybody is qualified to the same level. So it's very, very possible that somebody a quarter ago would have gotten a 4% interest rate. It's also possible that if you're a well-qualified borrower that you could get could have received lower than that. Now our expected interest rate on our evaluations is 4% still. So we still very, feel very confident that we'll be able to source 4% money for you, 4% loans for you. However, I think it's a, it's a real commentary that that buffer is smaller today than what it was before. And we're analyzing this on uh, really on a weekly basis. And one of the cool things about this show is that we have the, the opportunity to share that with you. If we would make a, a move and change that expected interest rate to 4.125% or 4.25%, you guys would know about it first. It would be factored into that future evaluation. And that way, the investor who buys that property would walk in with a real expected return on investment that is able to be achieved. Shall we, shall we see what that looks like? If we do it, Greg, we got uh, here, I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. So it's all on screen here. This is the assumptions here on the sheet are at 4.4%, right? So the ROI, you see it over here. It's at 8.96. If we are to raise that to 4.25, ROI drops a smidge right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it comes down to 8.28. Let's do it the other way around, right? I know that I'm getting quoted some like 3.8 stuff, right? So at 3.8, now we have a total ROI of 9.50, right? There you go. I'm also putting down 20% instead of 25%. So do that, boom, 10.78% ROI, right? And to bring that all back, it also drops a little bit of the monthly cash flow, but it increases the ROI. Yeah, why don't you explain that? You've lived this. Right. So talk about the advantages of 25% down versus 20% down. Sure. Advantages of 25% is kind of what we just explained, right? This is this is 20% down. It's 120 cash flow, 10.78% ROI. If I were to go back to 25%, this is still keeping the mortgage rate at 3.8, right? But I'm just doing this for the sake of this discussion. It goes up again a little bit more on cash flow. ROI goes down. So to me, I look at it and I'm not really worried about monthly cash flow as much as how you talk about it, Greg, this thing being scalable for me. I'm looking for something that pays for itself. 
I'm not going to spend that cash on anything other than sticking it in a bucket to buy more JWB houses and or for vacancy moments that I, that, that I need to have, right? That's being managed by my portfolio manager. So for me, it's much more attractive thinking that I'm going to hold this thing for 20, 25, 30, 40 years that I have that higher you know, point of ROI that's going to continue to compound. And then when you add the home price appreciation to it as well, you know, really start to, and, and, and you project that out a long ways, you know, really start to pay me back for my retirement, right? Like I'm 40 years old. I got a solid 30, 35 years of working in me because I love what I'm doing. And I really just want to have these assets that are going to continue to accumulate, continue to build equity and, and, and keep the cash flow going. And I, I'm sure at some point I'm going to cash out refi and, and, and buy some more stuff or do a 1031 for, for a couple of other interesting opportunities. But that's really what I'm in. I'm in it for the long run. So that ROI number is more important to me than this monthly cash flow number. Nailed it, man. I think that's a perfect summation of what we started the call talking about, right? When we started to call, talk about how to analyze a rental property investment, what I first shared with you was the first threshold is positive monthly cash flow. Once you get there, then you're looking at your best risk adjusted return on investment. In a nutshell, that's what you're doing. Yeah. And Lee, Lee brings up a good point. Pablo's looking at generational assets. And it is true. Really, for the first time in my life, I'm looking at generational assets, right? Like before this, it was like 401k. Will it last me till I, well, till I die? You know, buy a house. Is it going to be good that I can live in for my, right? Like I, I now look at this stuff as, as, as things that go beyond me right? Like whether that outlive me, that, that, that are going to provide benefits to people outside of my body. <laughs> we, got a, we, we got a question here from Denny Davies. You might have addressed this in another show, Greg. The new Fannie rules reduce their overall backing of rental mortgages by roughly 50%. This could make getting the best rates based on Fannie and Freddie backing much more difficult. Are you already seeing the effects of this with clients and are you concerned? Denny, first of all, thanks so much for being here. Denny is a very long-term client. Him and his family have been with JWB for many, many years. So, so nice to have you here, Denny. That has been a very important topic. And in fact, I remember I got the email from you about it. So we've talked a little bit about it over the past couple of shows. Big picture is, yes, you're right. It is going to make it harder for investors to secure the lowest interest rates on investment properties and second homes. What's happening here is Fannie is limiting the amount of loans that they are going to purchase, which means uh, when Fannie doesn't purchase the loans from the banks that originate them, the most advantageous terms are not there for the investor on the front end, meaning you who is getting the loan. A couple things to point out though, Denny, I did a lot of digging on this. And, you know, the information to truly understand how impactful this is, is kind of hard to put together. We pay a decent amount of money to some consulting firms each month. And I ask them to help me understand what does 7% really mean? Like, for example, if Fannie and Freddie were buying 15% before, and then they're limiting it to 7%, that would be really a drastic move. You know, if it was like 3% and now they're going to limit it to 7%, like I'm like, well, maybe that doesn't change things all that much in the short run. In the long run, it's definitely going to change it. We know interest rates are going up, but in the short run, that wouldn't have, you know, caused such a jolt. What I found was that I found data on Freddie Mac and I looked over the last few quarters and Freddie Mac has been purchasing roughly three to 5% of their portfolio has been investment loans. So to me, now that's, Oh, and the entire purchases for Freddie Mac. So to me, that doesn't signify that's going to be a major jolt. Something else that I was able to uncover, the way that they're calculating the 7% is not total portfolio for Fannie. What they are looking at is Fannie is looking at each individual lender over the last 52 weeks of their performance. And Fannie is not going to buy more than 7% of that individual lender's loans if it's over 7%. So it's on an individual lender basis. And that's substantial because there are some lenders that do a tremendous amount of second homes and investment property loans that are over 7%. And their, their interest rates are going to go way up. They're going to have to figure out some other way to, because that's going to be a big deal for them. But there are a lot of other lenders out there that are under 7%. And so the fact that it's on an individual lender basis to me means that it's not going to be this huge jolt to the system like we were fearing. 
because you would think that there are other lenders that could fill the space that would get access to that really cheap, inexpensive Fannie debt that, that would fill the space. So I think the answer is it's somewhere in between. I don't think it's this huge jolt to the system. I think it is one of the first big steps and many steps that we'll see interest rates go up in the short run and definitely in the long run. But we've looked at this a lot and we haven't changed our evaluations. We feel really good that we can still secure interest rates at 4% for clients. And we feel really good about that right now. But this is an environment that's ever changing. And so every week, I'll keep you updated. Danny Davies writes, wow, that is great insight that is not out there in the media. Thank you much, man. Yeah, you, you, that's the benefit of being a part of this community is having access to a guy like Greg that has a company that is fully vertically integrated throughout the whole process with 3,500 data points, with a round table of mortgage brokers that they meet with every month with a, you know, 7 million, you know, what is it? $3 million worth of construction that you start every month, right? Like with 3,500 properties and, 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 and 10 residents and owners and experiences for right? like all these, all these data points is what we hope that you get out of these calls and, and, and these moments for free, man. And, you know, we really just don't, we don't take it lightly that you take an hour of your day on a Thursday or a Tuesday to hang out with us. So we really show up here hoping to give max value. Greg, I think that that final question there really, really, really sealed it in nicely, man. Uh, really good job today explaining that stuff. I'm really pumped for Tuesday's call, right? We had a conversation with Bill Fox, who's going to be our, our guest on Tuesday. Bill has been investing in rental properties since like 1997 and, and, and with literally 1997, he's made some mistakes. He's had some, some, some great, great wins. He's had a lot of experience with JWB and now he's also in the short-term rental game, right? He's doing Airbnbs and he's doing both sides of the equation. So he's going to be a really, really great informational source to pick their brain. If you're curious about doing Airbnb rentals, if you're curious about, whether or not you got to pick one or the other, I think Bill's going to be a really, really good resource. And he's a, he's a pretty good storyteller, man. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to have him on on Tuesday. I hope you can all join us. And uh, this has been a lot of fun, Greg. Go to, go to JWB Inventory if you haven't done that. If you're not part of our Facebook group, go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. We're at 2,600 members, all brilliant, smart, educated real estate investors and people that want to get into this that are willing to help. Greg is in there on a, on a regular basis. So come hang out with us in the club and I'll leave it up to you, Greg, for a final word, man. Nice, nice job rolling out the new studio setup, my friend. You, you handled the camera and the microphone and your voice really, really well. <laughs> thank you, brother. You know, this is a team victory. Us all getting to, to enjoy this, this studio here. And thank you everybody for being here. I did want to recognize Nadim had a question here at the last second that I just wanted to answer. And then we'll, we'll go and uh, have fun the rest of the week here. Nadim brought up the fact that we didn't even talk about the $2,600 of maintenance costs that are covered by JWB on a property like this. So you know, and if you have additional questions on this, you can reach out to my team. We'll give you more insight. But the, the, the short story here is that for this asset, JWB is going to pay for the first $2,600 of maintenance costs for the client that purchases it. Maintenance costs are, first of all, the thing that clients hate the, hate the most. They like the least, right? It's a big pain point for clients. So if we can limit maintenance costs, that's a wonderful thing, especially for a new client. And uh, maintenance costs are the biggest variable that can swing your returns one way or another. So to know that you're walking into this asset class, into this property, knowing that you've got the first $2,600 of maintenance costs covered is a really big deal. You might ask, why are we doing this? Well, so when JWB purchases properties, we want to see what the standard is of that property. And sometimes it makes sense for the future resident who's going to be living there, for JWB, for the seller. Sometimes it makes sense for JWB to go in and say, you know what? This home right now is in a great standard. It meets the JWB standard, but there might be some additional things that we would do over time to make sure that there, there is no additional potential things that could go wrong. Like for example, and I didn't check this exact scope of work, but I've checked other ones where we give maintenance cost credit. There might be a shed that we're going to put on the property, right? If I don't put a shed on before the house sells and I do that six months down the line or a year down the line, no big deal, right? The, the resident's going to enjoy their, their time there. So things of that nature, up to the JWB standard, but things that we would do anyways to make sure 
that the long-term health of the um, asset is there. So that's why we do things like this. We looked at this and we said, well, the standards met, great resident that's going to be in there, lo no long-term deferred maintenance, but there's about $2,600 worth of cost that we are going to do at some point. And we wait until the first property turn happens. And so it's a better thing for the future residents, a better thing for the seller, it's a better thing for JWB. And it's a great thing for clients because you come in and you have $2,600 covered. Uh, so that's available on this property. It's not very often. So if this is one that you're interested in, reach out to my team, schedule a time to speak at chatwithjwb.com. And, and there you go, Nadim. Thank you so much for the question. Nadim, officially in the running for MVP of 2021 of the Not Your Average Investor Show community. Watch out, Lee Bishop. He's coming for you, buddy. Great show, my friend. Good job. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Take care.